Getting come to order. Um, the uh, I need a motion to approve the minutes from the last meeting. Craig, Becca, anyone? Peter. Uh, Peter. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone against? <laughs> All right. Um, Lexi. Okay. Um, first on the agenda is the, uh, a request to accept the bids from the 2017 Orange County Tax Disclosure. Um, we had a decent auction. We sold everything. Um, there was 25 parcels. And if you can see on your list, it'll show the taxes due were one hundred fifty-nine thousand three hundred twelve dollars and thirty-three cents. Um, the sale brought three hundred and ninety-four dollars and thirty-five. Sorry, three hundred ninety-four thousand three hundred thirty-five dollars. Um, so from the proceeds, twenty-five percent after the auction um, revenue of a hundred and. Am I doing that right? Where's Mike? <laughs> whatever the taxes were. Yes. And then you subtract $120,000 from that for our revenue. Auction so revenue. And then 25% of the balance goes into the uh, testing. testing. And so that would be about 20, <coughs> almost 29000 that's going to go into the reserve testing fund. Okay. Do we have a motion? Dennis, second? Je or Claudia? Um, you have a question? I Claudia? do. Uh, Lexi, on um, the two Johnsburg properties mm -hmm. with that Richard Green bid on, what's going on with that? Is it another sixty-four thousand, or did he? No, that we sold them as one. Okay, so it's a total. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? All in favor? Um, Aye. Any nays? Okay. Okay, um, next is a resolution to amend local law number 7 of 2008 um, and to authorize a public hearing. Um, this is to extend the Cold War veterans exemption. Governor Cuomo um, passed in their um, part of their budget that this get changed because originally when it was first set up for the Cold War it was only given 10 years for the exemption. And so he amended that to allow it to go on forever instead of cutting it off at this point. So there really won't be any change in anything. It'll just be a continuation. Um, Gene? I like that motion. Okay. I'm Second. Or Craig? Or Dan? All in favor? Aye. 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 By the way, does this, does our approval do it forever or is that just a... A yearly? No, it does it forever. Okay. Okay, third? Well, they live. It, it'll, what it'll do is it'll first go as the local law, and then it goes back to the right, next Right, I didn't know if we had to renew it each year. No, no, it's just we need to amend some language. <coughs> what, what, what was the Cold War era? Oh, it's going to be right here in front of my face. It's new. <laughs> uh, I don't know the timing. Just to include the Vietnam War there. World War II and yeah, it goes for Vietnam. Yeah. You're in it, Peter. That's, a, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, the Korean War and the Vietnam War, that uh, Cold War era. They had a 10-year sunset. There and this go. is just to give them... <coughs> it, there's a certain percentage and formula for all of this. Mm -hmm. But it's just to give them, they had a 10-year sunset. None of the others had a 10-year sunset. Correct. World War II veterans, Korean War, Vietnam War, etc. They don't have any sunsets. They get, you know, and, and there's a formula. Were you involved with combat and so forth? And if you were, you get a higher <coughs> uh, tax break. Uh, but this is just dealing with those Cold War folks that, you know, they got this 10-year, let's try this. They were veterans, and so this is just going to allow them to be extended. They don't get as much as the in-combat and the uh, actual war people, 
but they do get something like 15 percent or up to 15 percent. December 26 of 1991. So it's that okay. time period. 45 to 91. Well, and it had to be on any discharge. Okay. The town board, we passed it. So the, the, the Cold War is defined in, in the reg is 1945 to, is it 1991? 1991. Okay, but not those not involved in the other wars, because right. they have their own special right. exemption. Okay. Okay, Lexi? Rebecca voted on it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah we voted. <laughs> We're all good That was just a clarification. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so next is next is um, to authorize the chairman of Warren County Board of Supervisors to execute an agreement with New York State DEC for the Johnsburg parcel, um, 133.8-1-27, which is the Johnsburg garage that we've been working on doing the cleanup with. Um, last uh, week on the 23rd, we met with DEC. Um, up in Warrensburg, we had um, Ben Conlin, who is an attorney down in Albany, um, DEC, come up and meet with us um, in regards to pulling the tanks and any of the um, contaminated soil that may be there. Um, so from that meeting, um, they would like to move quickly, which is a good thing. We like to hear that. <laughs> so. Um, we discussed with them um, an agreement. Um, you would see that in your packets. Um, there may be some language change in that packet um, when Ben hears back from the attorney at the state, but um, we're just looking for authorization um, for the chairman to be able to execute an agreement. This will be going, um, if you guys approve today, it'll go to the special board meeting on the 3rd so that DEC can act promptly. Okay, um, Amanda just reminded me that we didn't have a vote on the Cold War. I, I do asked, believe, but I, <laughs> I do believe we had the Cold yeah. War. So, but Peter, who I kind threw of, me off. Kind of all in favor of the Cold War? Uh, aye. aye. Um, okay. We have a motion and a second, or do we need that? No, we had that. Okay, we had that. Okay. Okay, now on to the second. I'll, I'll make a move on the next motion. On the Johnsburg. We have a second. Claudia? All in favor? Oh, aye. aye. Oh, we have a, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Craig. It's just a discussion, and that's for up to $15,000. <coughs> yes. Okay. Would be all that we, a max is all that the county would have to contribute is 15000 um, We may be responsible for any of the stuff that's inside, like there's some barrels. Um, and some pails and stuff, we may have to be responsible for that, disposing of that, but anything that they find in the ground will be the state's responsibility. Okay, and then that'll bring it into our uh, ability for the county to take it over. To be able to so. foreclose, and that is our plan, is to foreclose, and then we'd be able to get it back on the tax roll. Thank you. I apologize. Bye. <laughs> I, I didn't. I wanted to get it over with before I forgot about it. So. <laughs> okay. Um. Hey, Lexi. Did you vote? Did they vote? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah, they did. <laughs> A couple <laughs> times. A couple <laughs> times. Okay. Um, and then next, I have to um, the almost monthly standard uh, approve the refund of taxes. They're all court ordered. Um, the first three were Lake George and their assessments were lowered by the court. And then the fourth one is the town of Queensbury, another court order with Queens or Kmart. Um, and that is just our portion on that one. Well, it looks like on all of them actually, sorry. Okay, do we have a motion? Dennis? Can second? Any uh, discussion? Discussion. Thanks. Uh, this Kmart one's been on, going on for a long time, hasn't mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How many years? John would probably be able to answer for that better than I would. Ten years. Wow. Okay. So, so during that interim, taxes were paid. That yes, they were. Yeah. They pay their taxes, but then they mm -hmm. they still have to file every year when okay. they're um, going through a court thing. So, yes. So, so no one's getting a check for one hundred twenty-four thousand dollars. 
Uh, no, that's the refund back to Kmart. Back to Kmart. That's okay. just the county portion. Okay. Um, the town has to pay their portion. The school would have to pay their portion. Ooh, so big check. It is. Any other discussion, uh, Claudia? Do we have a fund to pay for that? How are we paying for that? Out of contingency? Uh, bond my feel to that. No, no, <laughs> it's not a fund. It's just gonna. Hmm. Do not have a fund set up. Frank's rolling his eyes or something. Are you <laughs> concerned or? <laughs> we can't. Yeah, the court made I mean, a decision, so you can't really go against. The court. I meant sweaty Tom's <laughs> concern. <laughs> hey, all, do we have a vote? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, um, that is all I have in the real property end of it. However, Environmental Concerns um, has asked uh, Brendan, I don't want to mispronounce Query. it, Querian, <laughs> um, to speak in regards to the Adirondack Park and Warren County Invasive Programs. Thanks. Hi. Thank you for coming. This is on. I should be speaking into this guy. Okay. Oh, well, good morning. My name is Brendan Quarian and I manage the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program. Um, so I know Warren County has really been a leader in invasive species prevention and management in the Adirondacks. Many of you have been involved from the get-go, people like Dennis, Ron Conover, Matt Simpson. And I think some of this is going to be new for some of you. So um, we're going to go to the basics a little bit, but also talk about some of the progress that's been made over our tenure and give you an update on where things currently stand on this threat that is truly a threat not only to Warren County but across the globe. So to start out I want to give you a quick sense of who APIP is, who we are, what we do. So we're the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program and we're one of eight partnerships for regional invasive species management in New York. So this is us located um, up, in, up in the Adirondacks. We cover the entire Adirondack Park as well as the northern portions of Clinton and Franklin County. And we were established back in 1998 as the first PRISM in New York, and we have been a model for the seven others that are now established throughout New York. And currently, New York is the only state to have comprehensive invasive species coverage, which is pretty amazing. So our mission is to protect the Adirondack region from the negative impacts of invasive species. We operate under three goals. Prevent new introductions as best as possible before they ever get here rapidly detect and respond to new infestations, and manage existing priority infestations to mitigate their impacts. And we're funded through the New York State Environmental Protection Fund. So APIP is a partnership program. This is our core. Um, we were founded by the Department of Environmental Conservation, the Department of Transportation, the Adirondack Park Agency, and the Nature Conservancy. And we're actually housed underneath the, the Adirondack chapter of the Nature Conservancy in Keene Valley. And since our founding, there are now 30 plus cooperating organizations that assist us in our mission, which is critical. Uh, my staff is myself, two other full-time people, and one seasonal educator. And to try and address this major threat across such a large landscape would be nearly impossible. So we truly rely on all of our partners, including Warren County, to assist us in this effort. So going back to the basics a little bit. I don't think everybody in here knows what an, what an invasive species is. So I want to talk quickly about what they are and the impacts that they're having. And to start out, to kind of frame the context, I'm going to talk about what they're not. So first off, we have native species on the landscape. These are ones that were here prior to European settlement. They're indigenous to the region. Hopefully they'll always be here. A good example is the, the white trillium that's so common in the Adirondacks. Then we have non-native species. These were species that were brought from outside of their historic range, either accidentally or purposefully, to their new range. So a good example is the California poppy. Obviously, it's from California. It's not from New York. But when it gets here, it's not causing any harm. It's kind of minding its own business, doing its own thing. You don't really have to worry about it. Then we have nuisance species. So species like dandelions growing in our yard, deer browsing on our shrubs. These are things that we put our own perceptions on or our own judgments on. They are neither causing harm, significant harm, or positive benefit. Sometimes they're doing both, but it's our perceptions of what they're doing. And then lastly, this is what I'm going to be focusing on today, invasive species. So these species are also non-native. They came from somewhere else on the planet. 
but they're also causing widespread ecological, economic, and societal harms. And I'm going to focus on those harms a little bit to start, just to give you a sense of what we're dealing with here. So first off, ecological impacts. I'm sure many of you have heard about zebra mussels and quagga mussels. This is a picture from the Great Lakes, where you can see this entire beach is nothing but dead or dying zebra mussel and quagga mussel shells. And if you were to dig down into this beach, it's about 14 inches of nothing but those mussel shells. This is a species, or these two species were brought into the Great Lakes through the St. Lawrence Seaway in the ballast water of ships. They're originally from the Black and Caspian Seas. And once they were introduced into those lakes, they proliferated and spread to an abundance that is pretty overwhelming or un unbelievable. There are some that believe that you could walk across the entire bottom of Lake Michigan without ever touching the sand. You could just be walking on zebra mussel shells. And you can imagine having that abundance and density of filter feeding mollusks in a water body, taking out all of the phytoplankton and zooplankton that other, other species of fish and wildlife and plants rely on. Essentially, you're ripping the rug off, rug out of from underneath the food chain in that ecosystem. And from there, they have now spread via primarily recreational watercraft to other lakes like Lake George. Zebra mussel has, or zebra mussels have arrived in Lake George, and that's why Lake George now has, that's one of the reasons why Lake George has a mandatory boat inspection and decontamination program, which I'm sure you've heard so much about. Water chestnut. This is another one that um, is currently in the Adirondacks. This is on Lake Champlain. And you can see what that once introduced, this plant creates a mat of vegetation across the surface of the water. Very um, limited ability to recreate in these environments. Reduces swimming, reduces fishing, boating. And underneath that floating mat of vegetation, it's so dark that other species of fish and wildlife find it very difficult to survive. Phragmites. This is a terrestrial invasive plant that we deal with heavily here in the Adirondacks. This is one that um, is probably one of the worst wetland invaders in the world. The Adirondacks has about 600,000 acres of wetlands, so we're very concerned about it. And this is an infestation down in New Jersey at the Meadowlands that's about 5,000 acres in size of nothing but Phragmites. So again, pushing out the native plants and wildlife that rely on these wetland habitats for survival. And lastly, I'm sure many of you have heard about Hemlock woolly adelgid um, because of its arri recent arrival on Prospect Mountain near Lake George. But this is the devastation that results from a Hemlock woolly adelgid infestation. These are pictures from, the, um, from down, down south, the Smoky Mountains. You can see that hemlocks have been nearly extirpated from this entire landscape. This is midsummer, and these are all dead or dying hemlock trees on this landscape. The Adirondacks has the highest density of hemlocks of anywhere in New York State. And we're very concerned about hemlock woolly adelgid spreading into the North Country and taking out our hemlock resources because we're going to see a similar picture if that's allowed to happen. So um, it was discovered on Prospect Mountain this past summer. We were able to respond to that infestation, but it is currently spreading farther north, and we're going to have to deal with that. Economic impact. This just isn't a, an ecological issue. This is affecting the economics of the region. So this is a, an example of a tree-lined street in Worcester, Massachusetts, prior to invasion by Asian longhorn beetle. And the only effective mechanism to control ALB at this time is to cut down and remove any tree that's infested. So they had to go into the city of Worcester and over a 10-mile radius cut down every single hardwood tree that was in that city. So you can imagine the economic costs associated with that, just in direct tree removal, but also economic costs associated with reduced property values, reduced shade value, and just you know the aesthetic appeal of that community being, being reduced. We also have reduced shoreline property values and visitor spending as a result of aquatic invasive species. This is very common in the Adirondacks where you have lakes, uh, get Eurasian water milfoil or water chestnut, and those shoreline property values plummet because people don't want to come and rec recreate on a lake that's choked full of weeds. And you also redu get reduced recreation ac recreational access and tourism to that area because people can't boat and fish and swim like they once were able to. Reduced crop production. Here's an example of, da of damage caused by Eurasian boar or feral swine. You may not realize, but we had a, a population of 
um, feral swine in the Champlain Valley on Rolf's Orchard <coughs> just a few years ago. And luckily that population has since been eradicated, but in just one summer, those pigs caused about $20,000 of damage to that farm. Are those, were, are those the black boars we saw in the original picture? Yep, yep, in the beginning. And then increased construction costs. This is an example of Japanese knotweed growing through the pavement, newly, newly paved road. It can also grow right through the foundation of a house that grows so aggressively. There have been studies that have shown that if you try to build over top of Japanese knotweed, it's going to um, add about 10% to your con construction costs, so real dollars. And then lastly, human health impacts. So we don't all often think about emerald ash borer causing human health impacts, but if you have dead or dying trees in abundance, especially in, in cities and urban environments, there have been instances where it increases the rates of lower respiratory failure and deaths in those communities because you don't have those trees filtering the air like they should. Block signage and lines of sight. We have plants that are growing 15 feet tall in some instances, and if you have important signage along a roadway or you have you know, an intersection where people need to be able to see the line of sight, these can cause real safety issues. Come on. There we go. Tick-borne diseases. I'm sure many of you have heard of the increase in, in tick-borne diseases recently. There are several invasive plants that actually increase the abundance of ticks on the landscape. So things like Japanese barberry and honeysuckle will have major benefits to ticks if not removed. So in um, Connecticut, they did a study where they assessed an acre of barberry against an acre of native plants, and they found that the number of ticks in that acre of barberry was about 100 times more than the native native habitat. And then burns and rashes, lastly. We have two plants here in the Adirondacks that can cause serious skin irritation and burns if you're exposed to them. One is giant hogweed, the other is wild parsnip. So you can see that even five months after exposure, you could have a permanent scar on your leg if you're exposed to this. This is, this is uh, much worse than poison ivy or anything else that we're familiar with. Okay, so hopefully that kind of frames why we should be doing something about invasive species in the Adirondacks, but I want to address this question too. I mentioned that New York State is the only state that has comprehensive invasive species pro program coverage, and there's a reason for that, and it's this slide right here. So unfortunately, New York has the distinction of being the state that has the highest number and density of forest pests and pathogens in the entire country. So you can see we're here in purple, and we have in excess of 45 pests per county in most instances. This is just forest pests and pathogens, but if you were, look, were, to, were to see a similar map for aquatic invasive species, the Great Lakes would be that purple epicenter right next door. If you were to see it for terrestrial invasive plants, it would look more down in Georgia and Florida, because that's where the primary imports of um, ornamental plants come into the country. Okay. So implications for the Adirondacks. I don't have to tell you all that this is a very important place, both ecologically and economically, for New York. And um, to provide some context for why we are dealing with the threat, threat so aggressively here, I want to use the next slide. Most of this will be, um, I mean, this is stuff that you already know primarily. But when we're thinking about the Adirondacks, we're thinking big. This is a 7.2 million acre landscape. If you're including our, our jurisdiction, which is Northern and Clinton Franklin or uh, northern Clinton and Franklin counties. We're also thinking remote. Most of this land, even though it's very large, does not have easy access. There's only about 1,700 miles of state roads throughout this entire area. We're thinking protected. There's nearly 3.4 million acres that are protected as forever wild forest preserve. And this is good for us because it limits the amount of, of disturbance on the landscape where invasive species can establish and spread. You also have to think wet. There's about 3,000 lakes and ponds in the region, 30,000 miles of rivers and streams, and 600,000 acres of wetland. But most import importantly for our work, there's people. Come on. Where am I supposed to be pointing this, by the way? I'm assuming the... I think it's in the box. Over there. Oh, the box. okay. <laughs> Maybe that thing. No, oops. Not there. 
be it died, maybe need new batteries. Hmm. Craig, oh, there we go. Or the mouse. So for our work, we have to be thinking about the people on the landscape. We have over 100 towns and villages in the park and people living, recreating, and trying to make a living here. And that's so important for, for us because invasive species management is truly people management. These things are not really spreading on their own once from at least long distances. They're being brought to these areas um, either you know, by hitching a ride on recreational watercraft or t hitching a ride in someone's firewood that's bring, being brought up the north way. So we have to address the people side of the equation in order to have an impact. So here's an example of what I mean. Here are the terrestrial invasive species infestations that we've documented in the Adirondacks since 2002. And you'll notice that they follow these very linear corridors throughout the park and you have these large tracts of land that are still free of invasive species. Those linear corridors are roads. They're, tra they're traveling along the road systems where this disturbance is, is present and they're following where people tread. Similarly with aquatic invasive species, we've been documenting which lakes are known to be invaded and which ones aren't for over a decade now. And you'll notice that the, the larger lakes like Lake Champlain, Lake George, Great Sacandaga Lake, Long Lake, and Indian Lake are all invaded. What's similar about all those? Can anybody tell me? Go there. They all have major boat launch access. So again, when we're surveying these backcountry waters, foreign bases that don't have a boat launch, we're not finding them. They're following where people are accessing the lake. So the case for action in the Adirondacks. This is what gets me excited every day to come to work and address this issue. For aquatic invasive species, excluding Lake Champlain, there are only 12 aquatic invasive species that have been detected within the Adirondack region. And as of this year, three out of every four lakes that we survey is still free of aquatic invasive species. Now 12 may, that might sound like a lot, but if you think about the Great Lakes having close to 200 different aquatic invasive species, we're in a very good situation here and have a tremendous opportunity to prevent widespread impacts and new species arrivals. For the terrestrial invasive species in infestations that we deal with, most of the ones that we find are under a tenth of an acre in size when they're first discovered, and they're usually associated with a road trail or some type of human disturbance. So a tenth of an acre might be about the size of this room and when you find an infestation that small your chances of eradicating it from the landscape go way up. So we have an opportunity to actually put a halt to these things or even eliminate them from the landscape when we can find them small. And highly destructive forest pests like emerald ash borer and hemlock woolly adelgid are just starting to emerge in the region and are still isolated. So hopefully over time we can control these infestations and deploy effective countermeasures because they're still so isolated and small. So what is being done? This is where I'm going to go into what APIP is doing to address this threat. And the first thing we're focusing on is awareness building. As I mentioned, the invasive species problem is really about people management. So we're trying to raise awareness about what anyone can do to prevent the spread, what simple steps they can do to make sure that they're not transporting the next invasive species to the Adirondacks. And um, this is a, a short video. Is there sound in here by any chance? Um, there is. I, they had a problem with the speaker, so I believe it's turned down. Okay. Um, would someone with the mouse mind clicking on that? It's a YouTube link. It should, we have internet, it should pop up. It should just be a left left click. Yeah. On a left click. Huh. Well, that's all right. We'll keep moving on. Oops, sorry. Does this go back? Yeah. So I encourage you guys to the first one of the first things we did under this awareness building campaign was we created a series of short films about our work and what anyone can do to prevent the spread. These are available on our website at adkinvases.com. I encourage you to go take a look at them and um, just to better understand the problem and how we're trying to change public behavior. 
What we're also doing is holding numerous education, e educational events and trainings. Each year we hold aquatic invasive species and terrestrial invasive species identification, surveillance and management trainings so that lake associations can go out and survey their lakes for these species each year and report their findings to us. Um, we focus primarily on DOT and highway departments for ter the terrestrial invasive species issues because I showed you they're, they're spreading along the road corridors primarily because of disturbance, mowing, construction projects that are happening where fill is being brought in. And to date, or th this year alone I should say, nearly 2,000 people have been reached through these presentations and trainings. And as of 2009, we've reached over 15,000 people just through formal presentations like this one. Then we focus on prevention. So we understand that our best investment is to stop these species from ever getting here in the first place. Because once they arrive, we're going to have to deal with the associated costs and you know, logistics of trying to deal with them under permit restrictions, those types of things. Um, so prevention is really our best bet. You may have heard of this new program called the Adirondack Aquatic Invasive Species Prevention Program. This is a program modeled off of the mandatory boat inspection and decontamination program on Lake George, although the regional program is still voluntary. And we're promoting the clean, drain, dry approach for boaters that these are the steps that anyone should, t should take to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species from one lake to another. And I would encourage you to visit adkcleanboats.com to find the nearest location of, your, of a boat wash station if, you're plan if you are a boater to see where you can go and have your boat cleaned before you go to your next lake so that you're not spreading something into someone else's lake. Oops. Next, we're promoting know before you grow. We want to make sure that people know the sources of their fill, their mulch, and their soil for any construction project because there are species that can be transported in those materials to new sites. Um, as an example, just a couple years ago, the Whiteface Memorial Highway was completely redone. And up until that point, we had done annual surveys of that road corridor and found no invasive species. The year after that construction project, we found 13 different invasive species along that highway, just as a result of contaminated fill that was used for that construction project. And you could walk down the road and count every single water bar, and it had knotweed coming out of it. So know the sources of your fill and material and we really try to promote the use of native plants or at least non-invasive plants in your gardening and landscaping. And then don't move firewood. I'm sure most of you have heard about this. For invasive insects, they are commonly transported in firewood long distances. Th that's how emerald ash borer and Asian longhorn beetle have spread to new locations across the country. So it's really important that you use local sources of firewood and burn it where you buy it. And there is a regulation in New York preventing this the movement of firewood beyond 50 miles from where you purchase it. Early detection. We know that prevention is going to get us a long way, but there's always going to be some species that slip through that we're going to have to address. So we're training volunteers and, and staff to search for new infestations of invasive species on the landscape. We have an aquatic invasive species volunteer monitoring program as well as a backcountry monitoring program, and we have about 700 plus volunteers assisting us with surveillance and early detection efforts so that we can still find these infestations while they're small and hopefully eradicate them from the landscape. We also have the ability to rapidly respond to infestations once they are found. So we have both terrestrial and aquatic rapid response teams. These are four or five person crews that are here the entire summer working under us and they have the ability to manage these infestations once they are found. So um, the terrestrial response team has been on the ground since about 2011. The aquatic response team has only been on the ground the past few years. But in, in that time, the terrestrial response team has managed over 2,000 infestations of invasive plants, and 471 of those historic infestations have no plants observed currently, so they're on their way to being eradicated. Oops. We also have our aquatic response team that surveyed 126 lakes for aquatic invasive species in, since 2015. And the good news is only 10 of those lakes have newly existing infestations. So again, there's a tremendous opportunity to prevent the spread of these things into our lakes since we have so many that are uninvaded at this point in time. So that's, that's I can throw numbers and statistics at you, but 
In order for you to fully understand what's happening on the ground, I really need to provide a case study and pause here for a second. So here's an example of a Phragmites infestation that we found outside of Lake Placid on State Route 86 back in 2003. So this is the, the infestation here in the middle of the screen. This is the one that I mentioned earlier that has a fi there's a 5,000 acre infestation in New Jersey and probably one of the worst wetland invaders on the planet. And this is what it looked like in 2003. Unfortunately, at that time, we did not have permits in place through the DEC and the APA to go in and manage this infestation. So what we had to do is watch and see what happens when you do nothing about an invasive plant infestation. This is what happened just seven years later. This is that same wetland. And in just seven years, the Phragmites had taken over the entire front portion of this wetland and was expanding back into about 20 acres of wetland system which eventually connected it to the Off-Sable River. So again, very frustrating to have to see infestations expand and not address them when you, the chance is there to eradicate it. Luckily, we did get approval to do the first herbicide treatments on the Forest Preserve for these infestations in 2010. I want to show you what's happened since then at this site. This is going to be a time-lapse series, um, and you'll be able to see the progress that we've made. Oops. That went too fast. <laughs> All right, there we go. So if you were to go back to that same wetlands today, you would never know that Phragmites was ever there, and you would never know that we were ever there, because the wetland plants are coming back in full force and recolonizing this site. And this infestation is on the path to eradication. We're not quite there yet because it was fairly large when we started, but we're getting very close to having this infestation be completely eliminated from the landscape. And this is just one of the s several thousand that we're managing in the Adirondacks. Okay, sorry. I think this is working too well. Okay. Yeah, would you mind just clicking? Oh. Perfect. So as you probably guessed, we're collecting a tremendous amount of data on these infestations to be able to demonstrate the success that I've showed you so far. And we don't just want to go in and manage these infestations and leave because that's not the goal. It's not to completely remove them and leave nothing to come back. It's to make sure that native species are recolonizing the site. So we're doing significant amounts of monitoring and restoration to ensure that native plants and wildlife are returning to these once invaded sites. And we're using that data to um, conduct research and publish. So I'm not going to go into too much detail here. This is a little dense. But one of our most recent publications was in the journal Biological Invasions. What we were able to demonstrate through our Phragmites management efforts is that if you catch these infestations small, there's a very high chance of eradication, above 80% in most instances. But if you wait and do nothing, and these infestations expand, the opportunity for eradication can just plummet. It goes down to less than 1% after, a size, after an infestation reaches a certain size threshold. We were also able to use our data to predict where the next invasion of aquatic invasive species may be based on the various vectors into the Adirondacks as well as where our current infestations are. So this is a publication in the journal um, Ecosphere. And lastly, it, it's not like we're always having tremendous success. Sometimes we do fail. And it's important to share the results of our failure so that we and others don't repeat the same mistakes. So we've been able to publish some of our, one of our failures in the journal um, of Restoration Eco Ecology demonstrate this is what not to do, and this is what you can do to improve your success for future projects. And lastly, we're focusing on innovation and adaptive change. We want to make sure that we are advancing the latest technologies and science to ensure that we can have the most success or effectiveness possible in addressing this threat. So this is just one example where we're using um, UAVs or drones to map invasive species infestations, and I'll show you an example of what that looks like. Here's a wetland that we flew over last year. And even just looking at the 
um, the col different colors and vegetation, we were able to spot Phragmites infestations in this wetland. So these are those Phragmites infestations that we found from the air. And you can actually use different sensors. So this is the elevation sensor. Phragmites grows about 12 or 15 feet tall above the surrounding wetland vegetation. And you can see these pockets where those changes in elevation are actually those same Phragmites infestations. So we're going to be able to find these infestations without having to muck through this wetland, hopefully find them much faster and when they're small so that we can have that increased chance of eradication. We're also deploying a new system called BioBase, which is a sonar-based system. So anyone that's a bass fisherman has one of these units on their boat already. And those units can actually map aquatic vegetation. They can map the bottom sediment type of the lake, and they can map the depth of the lake. All variables that we need to better understand for how and uh, when a lake is, is going to be vulnerable to aquatic invasive species invasion. So I threw these last couple slides, and actually for Ron, <coughs> because uh, <laughs> he brings these questions up at our SAVE meetings all the time. So that's all great, you know, it, it, but is it working? You know, are we ha making a difference in the Adirondacks? So I wanted to provide a couple scorecards for where we currently stand. Here's the scorecard for Adirondack waters, lakes and ponds. So again, we've been mapping or surveying lakes in the Adirondacks since 2001. And as you'll notice, the number of invaded lakes has slowly risen over time. Although part of this is due to survey effort, increased survey effort. It's not like we're just finding 20 new lakes invaded each year. We're having added capacity come into our program to survey more lakes over time. But what's even more exciting is as we survey these lakes, the number of uninvaded lakes that we're finding is growing in, in paramount each year. And I want to emphasize that in 2017, it was the first time in over a decade that we had no new aquatic invasive species invaded lakes show up through our survey efforts. And I attribute this to the new prevention program that is now across the Adirondacks. Even though it's a voluntary program, it's having an impact in preventing the spread of these species into the region. And the scorecard for Adirondack lands. Here are all the terrestrial invasive species infestations that we've documented over our history. As I mentioned before, about 500 of those priority infestations are actively being managed. Those are the ones in yellow here. And even more exciting, oops, can you help me? Oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> oh go, go back. The other way. Oh. Yeah. So in green, these are another 500 infestations that have no plants observed at least for one year after our management efforts. We don't say a site has been eradicated until three consecutive years of no plants observed, but a tremendous number of them are transitioning to becoming eradicated from the landscape. And if you are familiar with the invasive species science at all, you know that this is an unheard of number. Eradication is very difficult to achieve in other settings, but it's because we have small infestations and we're finding them early, and have the ability to respond to them, that we're achieving this success. Okay, so in closing, I just want to emphasize again that APIP is a partnership program. We're very grateful for all the different organizations, whether it be lake associations, environmental advocacy groups, local government, for coming alongside us in our mission in protecting the Adirondacks. And I encourage you to join us if you haven't already. And with that, I'll open up for questions or discussion. And thank you for having me today. I'm Gene Merlino. I'm supervising the town of Lake Luzerne. We've been fighting uh, no foil for 10 years. We tried to mat it first. It was too, uh, too work oriented, too tough to do. Um, we finally convinced uh, the APA, the Health Department, the DEC, to let us use some chemical. We were the first lake in the whole state of New York that tried it. Mm -hmm. It only allowed us to do less than a quarter of an acre. Basically, it lasted five years. That was seven years ago. Now it's coming back again because the rest of the lake, we can't keep up with it. We have divers in there every day. We started at about 20000 a year. But we're we're going to pay 65000 this year. 
and it's really not much better than it was last year. Mm -hmm. That stuff grows, they pick it in May, you go back in October, it's growing again. I've tried to get the APA to, uh, you know, there was a big to do about it, chemical and Lake Luzerne. I mean, even the taxpayers involved in my meeting rooms and didn't want it because the word chemical, but it worked. Nobody was nobody was born with three eyes or no arms for the last right. seven years. Why does the APA keep fighting us on it? So on the terrestrial issue, on the terrestrial side of things, I think we've made a lot of headway and they've been we've been able to demonstrate success. On the aquatic side, there's only been two or three examples where herbicides have been used. I'm not sure we have the track record to support whether it's going to be a long-term solution for us or not. Um, for aquatic invasive species, in particular plants, if you have an infestation show up and you do not address it right away and allow it to spread, eradication is nearly impossible after that. So that we have a, had a couple success stories on Loon Lake and Lake Alice where we were able to go in and manage water chestnut and eradicate it from those systems. But for most lake associations that are dealing with milfoil control, it's a long-term sustained suppression effort. You're never going to achieve full eradication. And um, yes, we can pull in new tools and try to try different things to make sure or to see if we can increase our effectiveness. But based on what I've seen, man manual control will only get us so far. Chemical control will only get us so far. The solution would be a, a, an effective biological control agent mm -hmm. at this point, similar to what is being proposed for hemlock woolly adelgid, where you release a native predator into the environment and it controls the milfoil for you without having to invest in significant cost. I got, I got some information on a carp they have now um, that eats milfoil. And, but they introduce it, they're, they're, you can't reproduce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a triploid carp. Have you, have you had any, had know anything about that or yep. have any success with that? Yep, so Augur Lake was one to, um, to in introduce triploid carp. They, uh, they are very good at eating aquatic vegetation, but they do not differentiate between what they're eating. So they will eat any aquatic vegetation that's in the lake. We only recommend it for very severe infestations of milfoil where it's already kind of wiped out the native plant community. Because if you had introduced it where you al already have other plants, it's going to just devastate those plant communities. And that's my last comment is um, the area, some of the areas that we worked on this summer for the last three months really got probably about 22 tons of milfoil because we're weighing it as we take it out. Mm -hmm. Now it's being overgrown by a natural plant kind of a brownish plant, um, like circular and, and point, and it's, it's grown where the milfoil was taken out. Right. Do you know what it was um, or what it is? The diver told me the name, but I don't uh, I don't remember. But, uh, I mean, it's just almost an impossible, you know, you take it out of one plant, and now natural plant are coming back in that area, but they're coming back with a thing. Right. That's why, again, it, prevention is so critical on the aquatic side. Unless you prevent them from getting into the lake, you're going to have to deal with these long-term Well, it's little towns like we can't afford to keep having divers in there. Right. Four months. Yep. Uh, the diver I have in there now is suggesting that I get together with other towns like Queensbury, Lake George, and, and to kind of go to the AP because he wants to interject the chemical after he pulls the plant in the, in the heart. Not like the first time we had it sprayed on the water. And it really killed it. Yeah. You know, no foils. But it started coming back about two years ago, three years ago, and we get in there <coughs> two weeks a year to pick what's coming up. But that's we think it's coming back from the rest of the lake that's Oh yeah. You know, absolutely. Kayakers and canoes get it little boaters on the electric motors, get it and drop it back in the other part. Right. But to use Lake George as an example, so they had five different aquatic invasive species show up in about a 10 year, his, 10 year time frame. Asian clam, I think being the last one, s were spending a tremendous amount of money in management that ultimately failed for, for many of them, for Asian clam in particular. And that was the impetus for the mandatory boat decontamination program that's on the lake. Since then, no new aquatic invasive species have showed up on the lake. So again, it gets to where are our dollars best spent? Thank you. Thank you.
Um, Brendan Craig Leggett, town trustee there, we've spoken uh, before on things. What I noticed along I-87, there's Spragmites coming up and through, and also on Route 9 as it goes through town, we have Japanese knotweed in the state right-of-way. So uh, how does the state come into play with your program? Yeah. So DOT has come a long way. Um, as I mentioned, there are still some residual issues that we have to address in contaminated fill being brought to new locations, mm -hmm. but they assist us with treatments every year now, um, which they never have done before. We had just our response team primarily doing the majority of the treatments. But each year now, they assist, assist us with management of Phragmites along the north way. Um, on the local roads, it really falls on the highway department local highway department shoulders and we're trying to branch out into that audience to get them more engaged in treatments along their right of ways uh, but DOT has come a long way in assisting us. This year in the town budget we put some money into a line item to help with the invasive, terrestrial invasives program. Great. Yeah there's one infestation of Phragmites at the north end of Loon Lake that has been on our minds for a long time and we cannot track down the property owner <laughs> for that site to treat it. They're a tough one. We would really like to try and get to that. Brendan, last time we talked, uh, we were trying various management techniques for phagmites. Have we found one that you think is most effective? Yeah, yeah, for, for small infestations, that publication that I mentioned, We've managed over 350 infestations throughout the park. We expect that about 70% of them will be eradicated in the next few years, simply because they were at a size where herbicide treatments were effective in completely eradicating them. So again, if you can find them small and you can deploy the effective herbicide treatment that we, we use, there's a very high chance that they can be eradicated. The herbicide treatment has proven to be most effective. Yep. Okay. Yep. There is a um, biological control agent currently being researched for Phragmites at Cornell University. So for those very large infestations just south of Glens Falls um, that are well above this threshold where herbicide would be a tool that we could use, we hope that biological control agent will be ready over the coming years to release on those types of infestations. Yep. That, that drone technology was pretty intriguing, I thought. Uh, and the, uh, how do you determine where to go with that? I mean, and, and who, uh, is this a, do you guys actually control that thing and do it yourself or does yep. someone else do it? Yeah, so one of our staff members is a certified drone pilot. Um, we had him certified over the coming years because we knew the potential that this technology had for our work. Um, right now we're working through the various permitting processes with APA and DEC to be able to deploy it for the first time over the forest preserve. And we are prioritizing where we want to conduct those flights based on um, primarily where wetland systems fall within close proximity to the road that are where we know there are known infestations of Phragmites and other terrestrial invasive plants that are priority for us. What's it from the, so the drone gets up, it does, does, it does what it does, and what's the turnaround time from the time it's up in the air to a finished product where you can look at it and make a judgment? It's pretty fast. Um, so the, the flight time on the drone is about 20 minutes, but the thing can travel side to side about 30 miles per hour. Um, so you can essentially set your transects over a wetland uh, and have it go on autopilot, fly those transects for you, and then you use a post-processing software to stitch together the images that it, that it took along that transect, and then you can just look at the map on your own and pick out those various infestations. I would say from start to finish, what, in creating a map like I just showed you, you could do it in a day or less. Oh, wow. Brendan, have you talked to our GPW? Um, I'm not sure if we've been, it may, it may have been a while. I think it's, it's been some time since we came down here. Okay. So it's probably time. Yeah, I would think. Um, another question, the hemlock, whatever it's called, how close is that to us? And I mean, if it hits Lake George, it would be devastating. Yeah. So it's, it's on Prospect Mountain right now. Well, I know that, but I mean, how you, you said it was coming from the south up. Yeah. Once so up until the, the Prospect Mountain infestation discovery, we knew it was as far north as Troy, mm -hmm. Schenectady. So it made a significant leap to get here. 
Um, because of that, we suspect it's in between Troy and Prospect Mountain somewhere. We just haven't found it yet. And it could be other places surrounding Lake George, too, that haven't been found yet. So um, our hope is that we can expand early detection efforts for it over the coming years and really get a better sense of where it is. Because eventually, the hope is we can release these new biological control agents being researched at Cornell to have long-term sustained control. Any other questions? Yeah, just um, we have quite a bit of Japanese knotweed in, in Bolton. That's the at the center. Um, run by you, Brennan. By the, uh, the, uh, so we started a program to uh, begin to deal with it. Uh, but you're absolutely correct. What we suspect is that as our highway department did the ditching around town, of course, it's always looking for a place to uh, take that to adjacent property owner or somebody that needs some fill so we don't have to truck it way off the Timbuktu. So it, <coughs> it would appear that uh, what you said about uh, moving dirt uh, by highway departments uh, is correct, that uh, without realizing uh, our own highway departments have been facilitating the dispersal of uh, things like Japanese knotweed. And so what we're trying to do in Bolton now is to, uh, and I say try because we're I'm not sure we're totally successful. Is those projects, those highway projects that we plan to do uh, over the next few years, get out in front of that ditching, uh, so that we, if, for example, we have a Japanese knotweed issue, we can uh, begin to deal with that because uh, there's a very specific kind of application, as you know, an injection application that takes place in the fall of the year, and it might even take up to two years uh, to uh, uh, eradicate on that. And um, so we're um, uh, attempting to do a to survey and, and we do appropriate modest amounts of money for uh, Japanese knotweed eradication in, in our highway department budget. Uh, so that hopefully what they're doing is they're surveying the road we're going to do. And sometime in the future, immediate future, they're out there doing what they need to do to make sure that we have the best chance that that soil is being moved is um, free of uh, invasive. Yeah, that's great. I mean, the, so it's... I think that we're perfect at it, but we're right. that's, that's the goal. Those are the two biggest steps you can take is, one, training your highway department on what to look for and being aware of their upcoming projects so that they can avoid transporting these things from where they already are but also looking at where they are accessing their fill for projects, whether it be through a private company or contractor. They need to know where that fill is coming from, because if not, you could, you could wind up with every culver in your town having not we coming it up after those replacements are done. We've seen that happen. So those are the two things I would recommend looking into to prevent the spread. All right. Well, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other business that anybody would like to uh, bring up? Peter's happy. He's got his Cold War. I am. Exemption. I'm very happy. Do we have a motion to uh, pay Gene and second? No second? Oh, great. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh, great. We're going to start drinking. <laughs> <laughs> I think about what we can do.